Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to the Nishit Desai Associates Conference Call on Title Insurance, a game changer for structuring investments into Indian real estate sector. As a reminder, all participant <coughs> lines will be in the listen-only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Nishal Joshi Pura, leader of private equity and merger and acquisitions. Thank you and over to you, sir. Thank you. So welcome to all the participants uh, joining this session uh, in person and to all the participants uh, joined on phone. Uh, before I start, let me introduce the panelist. Uh, to my right is uh, Reema Mana. She is the managing director of Title Sol, uh, which is a leading provider of title insurance in United Kingdom. And she has worked extensively in India in developing this title insurance product for uh, custom and customized it with Indian real estate uh, industry. Uh, to my left is Sagar. Uh, Sagar is the India practice leader in the MA group at Willis Stars Watson, uh, which uh, is very active in placing some of the WNI and title insurance policies. Uh, to my extreme left is Simone Rees. Uh, she co heads uh, the mergers and acquisition and corporate governance practice and is very active in insurance space, uh, having worked with a number of insurance in, insurers in. Uh, and advising them on placing the insurance policies for India deals. So in this session, what we are going to cover, uh, you know, the biggest issue which is faced by the Indian real estate sector as far as deal making is concerned is the title issue. And what we are going to discuss today is, are there any ways where we can, if not eliminate, mitigate some of these title issues so that there are better ways to stretch some of these real estate deals which just fall apart uh, when the title issue is uh, discovered. So uh, the idea here is to find solutions and we'll discuss in detail you know how the product works, what are the pre what is the premium, what are the exclusions and uh, we'll go through everything in detail uh, so that uh, you know uh, we all can uh, discuss and see if there is any uh, uh, if, if some of this problem uh, with respect to title can be solved. Now, as far as the title issue is concerned, uh, and this is quite interesting, my first encounter with the title issue didn't happen while working on a transaction. It was actually while watching a movie in 2006, which was uh, Khosla Ka Ghosla. I'm sure all of, uh, most of you would have watched this movie where a middle class family was uh, defrauded by the developer. Uh, and a plot of land was sold which didn't belong to the developer and how revenge was taken by the middle class <coughs> family with the help of an agent where the developer himself was defrauded when a land parcel belonging to fisheries department was sold to him. So it, if you see uh, that's an ideal example on what all things can be covered in the title insurance policy and I'll give you a couple of more examples. Uh, one deal which we did in around 2009, this was a deal where one of the real estate funds was investing about 100 crore in a Delhi based uh, property and the property or the land parcel was owned by company A and the development rights with respect to the land parcel were transferred to company B. Now our client which was a real estate fund was going to invest in company B and based on the diligence we found out that the document which was the which was assigning the development rights from company A to company B was not stamped at all. And when we tried to find out what would be the stamp duty which will have to be paid if this document had to be stamped along with penalty and everything, that amount was coming to 125 crore more than the investment value which uh, investment amount that uh, client was going to put in. So this is one classic example on how a deal can fall through and actually the deal didn't happen because there was no way this could have been rectified. Similarly, there was another interesting example where uh, there was a developer in Mumbai who uh, was constructing a very market building in Lower Parel and the developer got all the approvals from all authorities, uh, uh, you know, BMC 
and uh, uh, local and other local authorities but what happened was while they were midway where about 20 floors had already got constructed there was a notice that was issued by Arthur Arthur Road Jail authorities so this building was very close to the jail and the notice said that now since you have constructed 20 floors if you stand on 20th floor you can see the jail so it's a big security threat for the jail and hence you need to stop your work we are revoking all the approvals and you know that's it now we can discuss this in detail whether these type of situations can be covered in title insurance because then the work stopped for at least two to three years and then everything had to be taken to the court and court quashed the jail authority order and you know all those things happened but in the interim if let's say this uh, uh, revocation was not taken back then there would have been a loss to the developer and to the investor who invested in the project so this is another example of you know title issue creating uh, uh, you know uh, issues on the deal making similarly there was another situation where there was a there was a developer who acquired a plot of land but the developer was funded by uh, another set of family member uh, so the entire money with the developer used for acquiring the land parcel was given by the family member at that time the amount was very small but 10 years down the line the price of this land parcel became like 30 40 times the price at which it was acquired and the family member claimed beneficial interest in the land parcel that even though the legal registered owner is the developer but uh, you know the entire money for buying this land parcel was given by me and that money has not yet been returned uh, neither do i want now but it has it had not been returned and hence there is a claim on the beneficial title to the land parcel so number of issues uh, and you know when we encounter these issues while doing deals it becomes interesting to see is it possible to resolve these issues <coughs> and if it is not possible to resolve these issues is there any alternative in the form of title insurance where we can cover some of these risks so let me move to uh, uh, Sagar first. And Sagar, when this policy was devised, right? What were the things that were taken into consideration? Uh, is it the feedback which you got from the stakeholders that this policy is extremely important and it will help us in stitching some of the real estate deals which are not going through? Uh, I think I'll take that question probably in in two different aspects. One from the insurer's perspective, and other probably from the uh, industry's perspective. Uh, the thing is, uh, when we started hearing a lot about uh, the requirement of title insurance per se as a standalone solution, that actually came in more from how the Real Estate Regulatory Act was developing and that's where the preliminary talks about having an insurance solution, uh, which which is also one of the ideas that was discussed as part of the RERA documents that came in. Uh, but I think the larger idea uh, for the requirement of this insurance, at least in the Indian context here, is, is from two aspects. One, uh, there has Historically, there has always been this form of solution available in the far more mature markets as far as insurance is concerned. Take it to the US or take it, um, you know, Europe or the United Kingdom, which is where Rima has had a lot of experience in. Uh, but the but in India, we've never had a standalone solution. Uh, simultaneously, the the idea was that it needs to have a very customized or a structured nature of policy form, something that we've seen evolve in the last six to seven years for a number of solutions, uh, whether we take it as a warranty and indemnity insurance solution that has uh, now kind of seen a slight bit of a maturity phase in the past few years or a tax liability insurance or a political risk insurance which which looks to cover you for an offshore investment which, which may have been under uh, a singular distress. So in that context, all of these policies that have come by have had that bespoke nature for themselves and also it has to eventually satisfy the requirement for which the investors or the, the insurer stakeholders would be looking to indulge in a risk mitigant of this firm. So in that context, I think that's how the crux of title insurance came in and simultaneously at the time when RERA was developing in mid of 2016, that's when this the talk of this solution started with the regulator, with you know the respective stakeholders within the insurance industry and also a lot of ask and queries coming in from uh, rightfully the financial sponsors who've, uh, who have ventured into the space significantly. Now given the uniqueness of each transaction or 
the challenges in each transaction or the way stru you know structuring of the SPA requirements, etc. Uh, that's how it's been at least potentially viewed that the insurance policy should be able to mirror, uh, if not you know exactly cater to every risk, but at least adhere to those unique forms of the deal transaction or the structure or the SPA, etc., which is embedded or incorporated into the policy. I think that's how the start has come. I think an investment of three years into this space, uh, you know, having spoken to a number of insurers, uh, including TitleSolve, taking a lot of cues from several, uh, you know, whether it's insurers or whether it's private equity funds or whether it's advisors uh, in the overseas space, whereas to what they have observed, what kind of policy form and structure is being adopted there, uh, to what extent have the claims risen, uh, in what scenarios have the claims risen and how they've been addressed to or not being addressed to. I think that entire cumulative idea of three years has eventually brought us to this day where now there is a confident solution available in the market which can cater to the title insurance risk, whether it's from the investor's perspective, whether it's from the developer's perspective, but keeping in mind the various moving parts in the Indian context, also keeping in mind the maturity that the product demands because of the kind of investors that we are dealing with, I think that entire idea has accumulated together over a span of three years. Okay, interesting. So, Rima, next question is to you. Uh, you have been an expert in this uh, title insurance product and uh, have worked extensively in developing this product for India. Uh, can you run us through the product and, you know, the nuances of the product, how, how can the yeah. uh, insured benefit from this sure thank thank you very much Nishal. um just to sort of link that into what sagar was uh, saying in terms of um, the necessity for the product for the indian market because i guess i could set the context for that and then explain how it was developed um the the reason the product came on the radar um in the indian market the primary trigger has been the rare legislation because sex, section 16 of the act mandates that you need to in time when it's notified at state level the developers need to buy it for any unit beyond um, any any development beyond eight unit but if you go back historically um you know land transaction as you rightly identified Michelle, has had a checkered history um and if it's in a bollywood movie then it's a real problem <laughs> <laughs> so i understand so so therefore um there's always been this uh you know, acceptance in the marketplace that, you know, Indian Indian land registration systems are not quite, um, you know, as established and as perfected as they ought to be. And so there are gaps from the international investor's perspective. But the, your economy is moving at such a, a, a phenomenal rate that there is a need for transparency in that one pillar, the whole fundamentality of property rights and rights in real estate, which creates stability in the market. So when I was asked for by the international reinsurers and the local insurers that we partner with here to look at developing the product and bringing it to the market, I looked at you know what the issues were in India. Looked at uh, with sat down with uh, real estate professionals, lawyers in in the Indian market, and tried to deconstruct where the issues were and tried to build for the insurers that are promoting the product in the Indian market a product that is relevant and will actually deliver real solutions. And what we found, um, so to explain the product, and this goes right into your question, uh, what we found is that there was a need for a hybrid product that would pull in different features of the product that, as it is applied in the international jurisdiction. So in the US, the product covers a host of unknown defects. Um, and when they do uh, engage in a property transaction, they discover a, a title defect, which they refer to as a cloud on the title, they actually exclude it from the cover. And so in the US, you get a policy which is all highly regulated at, at state level, and there are standard forms that are published by the American Land Title Association where you get the standardized form, and it, it lists all the defects that potentially might be unknown and latent embedded in the title. That sort of mirrors your Indian position because having started to work with the insurers here to look at the transactions, <coughs> I can't tell you a single report on title that I've seen where there hasn't been a reference to missing pages and documents or missing deeds and missing chains and titles. Um, where there are, the lawyers have said, insofar as we can identify the title is good and marketable, except that these things are missing, so we can't fully identify that. So the idea behind it was to create a product to cover all of the unknowns. And those unknowns go into five broad categories. They go into anything that affects the actual title or ownership to that. You get a plan and it says, that's the block of land that you own. But embedded in that, there might be issues around 
whether there is a missing link in title, whether somebody is in adverse possession of a part of your title, whether there is a, a bond, has been a historic boundary movement, whether somebody in the family tree might have reappeared, as, you, as you're mentioning, or whether there might be an unknown encumbrance, like a, a lender who has an equitable right that is not on the, on the actual official records that may turn up like that family and say later on, I, am, I loan money on that property and I have a right to recover it and they fight it out in the courts. Uh, so there's a, the title element, lack of links in title, because you can you can produce a chain in title historically if it was owned by the state in other territories. You think that that title is good in India if it passes from one ministry to another. There are issues around the holding of those records and whether the the, the, the chain of title is actually as accurate as it, it purports to be. So there's the title element of it, the core title element. The policy also then extends to lack of rights. So. Uh, your ownership of a plot um, and your, your, your ability to develop that plot or to use it in the way that you, you can use it is also pegged to the ability to use surrounding lands for access, for, for drainage, for whatever. We, the, the legal term is easements. And so lack of those rights actually can Im impact adversely on the value of the property. So the policy extends beyond actually the ownership of the title to the insufficiency of those rights, whether you have legal rights, whether um, you've acquired them by fluxion of time, a principle called prescription of law, and whether or not you can actually substantiate that as a developer, and that won't be challenged in future. It then goes on beyond that to cover the third category of risk, which are burdens and encumbrances on the title. So again, going back to that reference of unknown encumbrances, like potential lenders or who have loaned money on, on the acquisition, or I've seen title reports in the Indian market where there's a reference to a historic development agreement, for instance, where it's been granted. Historically, the landowner entered into a development agreement with a third party. That third party is no longer, uh, you know, available or it's no longer in the picture. But some th some subsequent purchasers is looking to acquire the property and they may decide that, you know, that is some an encumbrance on the title that they need to deal with. And that risk can be easily deflected onto the title insurance policy. Other encumbrances, you know, you may have um, a lawyer in a, a particular state doing all the necessary diligence checks to say the land isn't subject to rights, um, tribal rights in, under the Adivasi Acts. However, notwithstanding that, uh, there may be, they might have missed something in the diligence and there's an unknown in there and somebody turns, turns up later on. In Mumbai, you have a lot of slum rehabilitation projects and you have your uh, uh, an, an X, annexes one and two, which lists the parties that can make claim and you pay them out and you think everything's fine. And then you have an unknown third party who turns up and says, my name is not on that list. And you now have to look to relocate them. So this is where the, all of these unknown encumbrances are plugged into that third category of risk. Um, thirdly, fourthly, the, the t name, as I was saying earlier, when we were having an internal discussion, the name title insurance is a bit of a misnomer because as this product evolved in the international markets, it has had to evolve to actually also extend itself to transactional related issues that complement the title. So the, the title, the chain of title piecing together the ability to use a piece of property for what it is intended to is linked to the underlying title and the fundamentals of the ownership, but also to the planning history. So I as you know, if you, you only need to read the economic times realty section to see how many um, enforcement actions there are by local authorities in different states at the moment against uh, individual property owners for adjustments and amendments and alterations to property where they didn't get any sign off from or building regulations approvals and so the, the policy picks up any historic breaches in the planning <coughs> chain of that property so if you're, for instance, building or investing in a, a, a site that is a mark for a solar development and it's resident is, is, is zoned as, as agricultural and it needs permission to to, um, to to change over to commercial usage for the solar park, then there are issues around whether historically those permissions have been granted properly and whether or not, you know, at the time of which you're plugging in the investment, that chain of the, the, the planning aspect of the title is sufficiently covered. So that's the fourth category, so occupancy certificates, um, you know, completion certificates at the end of developments, whether they are missing, piecing together, historic licenses and permissions. It's interesting that you should mm -hmm. mention um, situations like, you know, you, you do a search 
and they didn't pick the, the solicitor didn't pick up that the property is being built within a military uh, uh, within so many uh, kilometers of an airport or a military zone and then your developer is left holding a property that is not they're not able to develop as a result of that because of these errors in the historic searches and the fifth category of risk which is actually the most important one is the um the undiscoverables because as as brilliant we're in one of the most preeminent law firms in in globally i dare say and, and definitely in india um but you're still human beings and you can't tell whether a signature on a document is fraudulent or not. You're not handwriting experts. And that's the element of, of the risk that title insurance policies pick up. There are no fault policies that actually pick up uh, elements of fraud or unknowns, signatures being improperly granted, not knowing that uh, the stamp duty hasn't been paid properly, for instance, on, on, a, on a particular unit. So that's the fifth category of risk. So the, the policy, in summary, covers the unknowns and it covers the undiscoverables. But beyond that, um, going back to my, my where I started the conversation to say we looked at the US market where it covers the unknowns and the undiscoverables, we then looked at the European markets where in a completely different fashion, the product is flipped on its head and it covers only known defects that are discovered during the title diligence process. So they in europe they have very sophisticated land registries you can go and interrogate the registers you can go in real time and print a document to any property that you own in a matter of seconds and so you can see all the encumbrances you can see all the burdens all the titles they follow what's called the torrent system internationally so the state guarantees the title india is moving in that direction slowly with the land titling legislation and one day you will get to that point it will take a good few years for that to the sheer scale of the task is is beyond you know human conception uh, so it will take some time in the meantime you have land records that are not necessarily perfect and can't be interrogated in the way that they can in international markets and you have documents that are being prepared reports on title where known defects are being flagged and those known defects um are what we ensure in the european markets we as insurers look at that particular risk and, and bolt it on to a specific um, policy and bespoke it as an endorsement. So a classic example is you have a commercial building in the city centre of Mumbai and you look at the chain of title and you have um, on it, it says that in 1962, uh, Party A was granted a lease for an occupational lease for that particular unit for 99 years and he vacated the premises in 20 years ago and you don't know where he is but at least still appears on the register the underwriters look at that specific risk and they will cover a potential challenge in future from that party claim, coming back and claiming to have a benefit of a right to that lease and seeking to dispossess whoever is in current occupation of it so that's an example of a known defect that's also plugged in so policy covers Unknowns, it covers undiscoverables, and it covers known defects. And that's it. why we built it like that, is because when we were bringing it into India, we wanted to build as wide a scope as possible so that you can absorb as many risks to enable transactions and to actually create comfort for international investors and for local investors. And for ultimately, if you think about the designs behind the rare legislation, these products ultimately are designed to benefit the consumer, to create transparency in the and, and, and to introduce greater corporate governance and risk management structures into the real estate transactional sector. And that's really where uh, the the value of it and the, the mechanics of it works to actually that so that's the coverage. I might just spend one second more. Sure, I know sure, I'm over, overriding. One second more on the actual resolutions. So having found in an, an unknown latent defect coming to light, the known defect that you've underwritten actually triggering a claim or there being an undiscoverable that has now become discoverable that potentially can create a loss against the property, what the policy does is it responds in one of three ways. It will either look to pay out to the third party that's claiming and buy the rights off of them. So let's say somebody is challenging the access, we will the, the insurer will pay to acquire the, um, the the deed of easement from that party so that you are allowed to have the rights. If if somebody's challenging a portion of the the unit inside, it will it will pay out and buy their title from them. 
The second element of it is that if, if for whatever reason that is not a workable solution, it would potentially indemnify the insured for whatever loss they have suffered. So you look at the value of the site and you look at what the actual loss ha has um, occurred as a result of the dis defect and they could be indemnified for that. There is also an option to defend the challenge or to, in most of the cases, you're on the defense side because somebody's threatening an injunction, somebody's trying to, to claim ownership and, and claim an equitable right in the property and, and dispossess you of it. So the, the, the insurer has to respond and step in and defend that case for you or litigate on your behalf to make sure that you have acquired the sufficiency of rights that you require to, to actually continue to use the property in the way that you want to, to use it. And um, beyond all of that, underpinning all of that, it is title insurance policies are called legal indemnities policies in the international market. Um, and the clue is in the name. They pick up all aspects of the legal, legal costs associated with resolving the claim. So whether that means writing a letter to say you haven't substantiated your claim please go away to actually funding the litigation or following the cost um, the cost order of the court and the, the order of the court to indemnify third parties. All of that is, is encompassed in it. So hopefully that's given you a, a spread from the coverage to the resolution uh, and, and we'll obviously can flesh out more in questions later on. No, this is interesting. In fact, uh, I think one of the interesting things that you mentioned is typically in any insurance product, if there is a known risk then the insurance company will not insure that. What I hear you saying is in this policy, some of the known risk also can be covered yes. if the insurance company gets comfortable with that risk. Yes. And I think that's a, a huge benefit yes. uh, because you know typically there will be certain known risk in any deal yes. uh, which is done in the Indian real estate sector. Mm. And if we are able to insure even those known risks, then you know clearly yes. that's going to be good from a deal making okay. perspective. So let me move to uh, Simon. Uh, Simon, you have been a pro at doing uh, warranty and indemnity insurance deals and uh, uh, you have done number of deals uh, both on the sell side and the buy side. Uh, how would this title insurance product be different from a normal W9 insurance product? If you can throw some light on it. Sure, Mr. So I think, like Sagar mentioned, the WNI insurance policy uh, program um, has been is now we can call it quite a mature program. Uh, I think three years ago we wouldn't have said the same, but given um, how it has picked up in the last three years, it's quite a mature program. But the essence of a WNI program is really it's a basket of risks. It's not necessarily bespoke. It covers a basket of risks, uh, whether it is. Um, corporate business issues, um, corporate issues, uh, litigation, uh, financing, and so on and so forth, which typically are things that are represented by a seller to a buyer. So it covers a host of things. Um, a title insurance is a more bespoke property, uh, property linked um, insurance, which is deals with one asset and one asset alone. Um, and as Rima said, although it's called title, it perhaps has more than just title but the ability to use property so it's so it's more expansive in that nature but it is limited to the asset uh, and, and that asset itself um so that's one sort of differentiation the kind of product i think the second really or second one which is really key is that a rep and warranty insurance really requires warranties to be given by somebody other than the one that's been uh, insured in a buy side policy and um it, you know and to somebody in a sell side policy. Um, a title insurance, on the other hand, is an insurance policy that you can get for yourself. You don't require the intervention of any third party giving representations and warranties or warranting any element of that property. So it is you, um, your asset, some documentation or divisions that you've done on that asset, and the insurer that are the only parties to this, um, to this, to this, to this product. So that's um, a big difference between a WNI insurance policy and um, a title insurance. I think the next one is really assignability because um, a WNI insurance policy really, you know, is is for the person and the person alone who's buying that insurance policy. Whilst a title insurance can also be um, assigned to a third party buyer, RERA itself requires that the insurance policy be given to the allottees. 
So therein you'll have the, the concept of assignability. So once you've bought this product, um, it is for the asset and it moves with the owner of the asset so long as you know the claim period is intact. Um, I think the next one is really um, is the exclusions really, uh, where you have um, a WNI. Both insurance policies are looking to cover you know real unknown unknowns, uh, but the ability for a title insurance to cover known issues is higher than maybe a WNI insurance policy. So the 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 outlook is to cover everything to do with that uh, with that with that asset. Uh, except things that you know are, are already built into the risk, so um, that's another sort of key differentiation. Um, I think time period again is another sort of key concern or issue because uh, title insurance by themselves, I think, bases recommendations from the IRDA have a minimum of a seven-year period. Um, a WNI insurance policy can you know can be uh, is is flexible. Um, and you know, typically you have three years, seven year period for fundamental warranties. You have a you have a range of things that need to be negotiated. But um, given the kind of asset, um, a, a title insurance, and given the recommendations of the IRA, um, and and you know, um, there is there is a seven year sort of limitation for uh, this insurance uh, policy, at least seven years. And I think. Um, the last one that I would want to sort of touch upon is uh, in terms of the documentation required to actually get this policy in place. Now, um, in a, in, you know, you can, you can also just rely on a diligence report that is perhaps dated as opposed to something that is requires to be updated on a timely basis at the time of the insurance policy itself. Um, and maybe we can cover what that means for, you know, for, for deals, especially which have to be done on a, on a fast track, on a fast track basis. Um, you know, even if you have a title diligence report of that is maybe dated three years ago or, you know, uh, or two years ago, uh, that should suffice, uh, to give the insurer comfort, uh, that this, you know, or, or to, to place this policy. So you don't really need to have an updated diligence report. Uh, at the time of getting that policy in place. So I think overall, given that this is a bespoke um, policy for an asset, which covers very specific risks, which covers, which is meant to cover, um, you know, title and more <coughs> of that asset. Um, it is, it is, um, you know, very different from a WNI policy and, uh, and, and, you know, is, will, will be used hopefully extensively, uh, especially in the real estate sector. Sure. And uh, I think one more difference between WNI and uh, title insurance policy is also that in WNI insurance, you are expecting some warranties to be given by one of the counterparties. Then only WNI insurance will be available. But in case of a normal title insurance policy, you don't need any warranty from any counterparty, <clears throat> which means that if I am a developer and I am buying, let's say, a land parcel, then I can directly go to Title Sol and get an insurance policy without any warranties being given by anybody. So I think that's one more difference. But let me come to the million dollar question. I think any policy is as good as what is included and what is excluded. Sure. Uh, can you throw light on, as far as the product is concerned, what all things are covered and what all things are excluded from the title insurance policy? Of course. Um, so I, I guess I can pick up on just immediately to, to jump into what's um, excluded, um, just in reference to what both you, Nichelle, and Simone said, is that the policy does cover known defects, and that's down to DNA of the policy because it's a retrospective-looking policy. So it doesn't cover future events. It covers anything that is, is um, embedded in title from the date of, of acquisition of the property going back to time immemorial. A lawyer checks the... The chain of the title going back 30 years this policy applies for the incept till for, for the creation of the, the property oh. itself straight down to <clears throat> the time at which you buy it and for that reason going into the exclusions it ex excludes risks that are created in future so it would naturally exclude collusion and fraud embedded in the current transaction where there's fraud be or collusion between the seller and the buyer it would exclude future created events so uh, a planning authority 
giving planning permission for the development of a site for a particular unit and then later on changing their mind and deciding that they're going to put a moratorium on that development. I know there's been a lot of press in India around these sorts of circumstances, but the answer to that question is that this is an administrative law issue and there are other avenues, legal avenues and channels that you can go through to, to challenge um, those kinds of decisions by, by government bodies and, and unravel that, that transaction. Because this is ultimately a consumer policy, the, the wording has been has had to be absolute made absolutely clear because ultimately on the rarer policies specifically the allottees will benefit from the policy so they should be able to read it in plain and simple language and understand what is covered and what's not covered so i i often when we were looking at uh, launching the product and so on was asked a plethora of times by developers by legal advisors cfos you know tell us that this policy isn't onerously um, being prejudiced against the Indian market. And there are, it's not littered with exclusions that are there that are not on the international policy wording. And the answer is no. There, there are standard templated types of exclusions that you'd find in any international worded title insurance policy that find themselves in the Indian policy. So things like this, to make it absolutely clear, we're not covering, it is a title insurance policy. So it's not covering property damage, fire, um, you know, anything that's related to cyclones, anything that's uh, in force, physical damage of property. It's not covering situations where there are ha there's hazardous waste or environmental issues related to property. So if the, if the property is then, and, and linked into that, the zoning issue, the property is then declared a conservation area. That's not a risk that's picked up. And that's, that's fair enough. It's not covering um, <coughs> situations where documents have been missing by as a result of deliberate collusion between parties leaving that aside it does cover any kinds of issues around missing documents relating to flood fire you know just things you know documents being destroyed by accident anything that's missing from the records is covered apart from that um it doesn't cover uh, situations where for instance um you know in, in future the, there is an error in future conveyancing transactions where you you're now selling the property and your lawyer makes a mistake in a future deed and creates a new risk it's only covering the state of the title as it's crystallized at that time and actually that is about it in terms of the exclusions they're not very extensive they they mirror largely what's out there in the international market on the tribal rights issues it it covers the policy does cover uh, rights that have not been identified where the proper diligence checks have been done so if a lawyer does all the research and determines that you know the property isn't affected when they, they interrogate the registers in a particular state that that property isn't afflicted by tribal rights issues and they buy a buyer purchases the property um with that knowledge on the basis of the advice by the lawyer and it turns out that there is uh, an adverse tribal right, it will be covered, but it won't be covered if it's flagged in the report. So anything that's known, that's flagged in the title <coughs> report, as Nichelle said, it doesn't mean that it's not insurable, it's just pulled out and it's underwritten. It may not be insurable, but it, there is a possibility that it can be and it can be bespoke. And uh, I think if we can spend a couple sure. of minutes on what is insured, what yes. is covered. Okay. We talked about exclusions, Yes. but people would also want to hear what all risk are covered yes so so as i mentioned earlier it, the, the the title defects are covered so anything that's a title defect interestingly one of the the the, the, the policy lists uh, 20 perils and 20 of the globally conceivable types of title defects that you can imagine so it starts with lack of title it starts with errors in plans historic plans uh errors in the descriptions of the property indeed you know you buy a property now and it would it, it what what it appears like on the ground isn't what is showing on the title because roads move you know uh local authorities and 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 co municipal corporations come in and they make adjustments you know neighbors move in and they move boundary fences and so on you never know what is on the ground whether it's reflecting your leap to legal extent of your title so it covers that it does cover um i picked up in the uh et realty i was saying earlier um 
the uh, in the press last week there was a, a, a reversal of the decision of the of the commercial courts um, related to the preference transaction with JP builders um, and in in property law if one party sells a property to another party at an undervalue or for no consideration and those parties are are interlinked um, and they have a relationship that's deemed a preference transaction and could be inferred that the transfer is being done on the basis of avoiding creditors because the property is a security asset that somebody <coughs> who has loaned money on that property can follow the asset into so this is a risk that we cover all the time in the international market and i've had developers and other potential buyers say well we, we don't encounter that in india but it was put into the policy because it still is a conceivable risk that may occur from time to time, as was reported in the press last week. Um, it covers missing occupancy certificates, missing uh, historic building regulations license, lack of planning permission for certain aspects of the development where it was unknown at the time that it was required and the thing has been built and there's been no enforcement action and, and from the underwriting perspective, a period of time has 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 passed and there's been no action but there's a potential that there's a risk in future it covers missing parties with interest tenants uh, whether they be equitable interests or legal rights and if it's equitable it's, it's a your the risk profile is higher because you don't know when where that is it's not documented anyway that right um so lack of <clears throat> lack of access lack of drainage sometimes you're building these wonderful lovely architectural businesses buildings where they overhang other over sale other people's properties um, in if you're building solar parks for instance in in rural areas then those those sites may be affected by tribal tribal issues they may be you know where you're running the cabling the connection the interconnections you know the units may have to be removed all of those things can be contemplated in bespoke policies and actually what I'd probably go beyond that to say is that you also need to think about this in the context of not necessarily not only about the, the type of type risks that are covered, but the category of developments that we covered, because very often the, the conversation around type insurance centers around just residential development units. But it, it goes, as long as there is a property, it's a, there's a real estate asset, it doesn't matter what use that's being put to, it's still insurable. It could be, there is a, a host of activity around um, industrial warehousing units and that's a very buoyant sector in india at the moment you've got mm -hmm. lots of mnc's building you know chains of stores across pan india he, he, ikea for instance is going to build 25 stores over the next year in next couple of years in india you've got uh, shopping centers being built where ultimately if the the underlying value of the the real estate the freehold asset falls all the leases by the occupational tenants in the retail units also fall so you need i think you know this is this this conversations like these about are about educating the indian market about the possibilities and the various applications of the product beyond even just looking at the title the the the, the wonderful thing about it is as i mentioned those 20 perils just to round off because i can't go into all 20 but sure. we'll share with it um but the, one of the risks is that the title is not good and marketable and that's the catch-all phrase that encompasses yeah. everything. everything. Anything that affects the title not being good and marketable is covered. Yeah. Okay. So, so Rina, actually, it, it sounds too good to be true. <laughs> so I think it, it'll be helpful to sort of understand yes. how, you know, the insurer has gotten comfort on Indian real estate just to, you know, to sure. write these policies. Yes, so, so obviously it's a new product in the Indian market and Sagar will tell you from his back in the WNI days, you know, it is challenging, you know, launching a new product when you've got international reinsurers and local insurers that are very, very careful about protecting their reputation and the reputational damage around, you know, not providing a product that is relevant <coughs> to the market. So a lot of research went into that two year process of looking at what would be a viable product for the market. We pulled, as I mentioned, on the product build the international wordings and sat with lawyers and found a local equivalent, then constructed an underwriting manual behind that, that actually assesses, you know, what questions a local Indian lawyer would ask in terms of whether that, if that risk became real, what were the potential payouts in the event of a claim? What would be the legal, average legal costs? What would be the options for resolving the claim? We then paralleled it with what we, we experienced in the international market. And then we looked to, 
the jurisdiction that most closely mirrors the Indian market in terms of the fundamentals of property law, which obviously is the the English, the UK market, where you your you know your, the pedigree of your law stems from the the UK law and the common law jurisdiction. So therefore, and actually surprisingly enough, um, I am from another common law territory. I'm from the West Indies, and um, you'd be surprised as to how all of the ex colonies, the the transactional structure is mirrored and, and a conveyancing transaction follows essentially the same process as it does in Trinidad where I'm from, as it does in India, as it does in London. So with that I was able to give the insurers here and the reinsurers the comfort that it's not as mystic the Indian transactional process is not as mystical as it appears. There are there is a lot of alignment with what happens here transactionally and what happens in the global market. There are idiosyncrasies in terms of the local landlord which we address. And then we took the loss ratios from the international experience uh, and, and, and use that as the benchmark for actually building the rating model. So the rating model takes into account, um, it rates by state based on the profile of those states. Um, it rates on the basis of the quality of the insured, the quality of the, 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 the legal diligence that's being done on the title, the law firm, and, and we put in parameters around that. And it then rates on, you know, um, whether there are known defects and whether you need to load it, whether, you know, what the, we look at um, in terms of the assessment, what's the probable market loss. So that's another um, linking into that very important question. How do you as assess the exposure? Even though the sum insured is typically stated to be the gross developed value of the site, the, the nature, the specific um, nature of title defects is that in, say for the event of a fraud scenario, you're never really looking at a total loss on site. You're looking at the potential for um, that risk to be fixed in some way, either through one of those three mechanisms that I referred to earlier. And therefore, the rating mechanism actually links into that and presupposes that you will never really suffer a total loss. So the rate is set at a lower level than what you would probably see, in, uh, if I uh, if I dare say, in the, in the WNI markets and other types of insurances as well. Sure. So, Sagar, my next question uh, is very close to the heart of all the insured <laughs> pricing. What's the pricing, and uh, what are the retention related criteria for title insurance policies? I think that this is one core question which 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 had to had to come up. But uh, pardon me for not probably having. A, a direct answer and I probably wish to give a background as to the context of how the pricing has developed but um, given the initial part of our discussion where we mentioned that this is a truly structured or a customized form of insurance unlike how we see the generic insurances which are more uh, now in the context of an off-the-shelf product but uh, given the uniqueness of each policy that is underwritten basis how the deal or or uh, you know the requirement of the insured parties that is there. Uh, obviously, there are several factors determining uh, because it could be a residential deal, it could be a commercial, it could be a, uh, you know an IT park and SEZ. So uh, these factors obviously will have its uh, set of uh, impact on how the pricing model and the calculations are made, and especially from the underwriting uh, teams. Uh, given that we are also looking at covering not just unknown issues but some element of known issues. Each known issue can have its own set of challenges, or, or uh, in some form, a clear impact on what's the, you know, a potential claim scenario that can arise, to what extent it can arise, and obviously, uh, given that we mentioned in the start that these are long-tailed policies, you're looking at ten years upwards of uh, seven years, and can be chosen, you know, for example, all the way twelve years. Uh, mm -hmm. Putting all of this in place, you will have an eventual pricing which. Uh, you know, will differ from a transaction to transaction perspective. But uh, if I have to take the liberty of uh, providing a slightly broader range of how uh, the policy has functioned and given the limited amount of experience within the Indian market that all of us have uh, seen in successful policies being placed, I think it would be within the range of about 0.5 to 0.6 percent of the limit of liability being purchased. Uh, put that into a sub point where how the limit of liability or the sum in short so to speak uh, we arrive at there will there'll be two forms of it one where we consider an entire project value and when I say project value it will include the asset the developmental cost the actual asset in its own tangibility and obviously a potential 
a future earning or a profit cost that can be embedded in because that's how probably maybe an investor would look at it but maybe a developer would look at it maybe in a different form uh, i think 0.5 to 0.6 percent of mm -hmm. that uh, sum in short if we take the full project value that's one part of it uh, there is an alternate mechanism which i'm sure Rima should be able to throw a little more light on that uh, which is the loss limit concept where you do not take the insured value at the absolute full project in terms of developmental cost and so on and so forth uh, you assume basis valuation models and obviously having taken advice from the several uh, you know uh, experts who are engaged in the transaction that what's the highest fathomable loss that can come into picture uh, there can be obviously a scenario where you're looking at a large land parcel and not every aspect of that entire land acquisition may be a sensitive area if i may uh, so there is that difference where the insurer gives you that option to explore in terms of a full value or a loss limit value obviously because you are narrowing it down in loss limit where uh, you know you're refining the mannerism in which you're calculating a loss and your valuation uh, that can have a impact on the premium which would be on the higher side uh, that maybe i think would feature within the range of about 0.7 to 0.8 uh, like I said, these are very broad range uh, premiums that we've observed. We've seen it on both aspects where depending on what kind of title DD has been taken, uh, like Rima mentioned, the insistence is not that uh, we need to have an absolutely updated DD. But given the kind of diligence that would have been done, you know, the legacy of the advisors who've taken the uh, liberty of creating those DD reports, uh, probably the number of times the title has exchanged hands, that will also come into play. But I think it will be fair to assume that we would range between a 0.5 to 0.6 or on a loss limit basis maybe 0 0.7 to 0 0.8 uh, from uh, for pricing that's one uh, coming to deductibles which which as as a feature will be in every insurance policy whether we are looking at a directors and officers or a fire policy in that nature uh, from an excess perspective uh, and i'll obviously invite rima's thoughts to elaborate a little more uh, on that what she's observed in maybe a different geography and how that applies to the Indian context but from the excess perspective uh, the retention expected is about one percent but if it has to be a pure deductible and that's the true skin in the game which is expected out of the insurer for the investor uh, to have in play uh, that's uh, roughly in the range of about ten percent at the current pricing that we have provided uh, like I said Rima should be able to explain a little more but Obviously, the alternate models also come into play where we look at other liability insurances, if I may take that example, where if there is a negotiation possible in terms of whether the deductibles need to move upwards or mm -hmm. further down, sure. uh, it will have a clear impact on how the pricing sure. moves accordingly as well. But I think, uh, Reema, if you could uh, throw a little more light, I, I, I know we've spoken yes. about this, but yeah. on the deductibles aspect, uh, some, some clarity from you yeah. will, I think, help the audience. I think, yeah, just, you know, the product, as I said, it, it was a, a two to three year process in the making and then it went through as you, um, when it went through all the inquisitive, inquisitive minds, uh, a, a period of refinement. And we started with a 1% deductible uh, um, excess on the, on the sum insured on the basis that, you know, the reinsurers, the international reinsurers and the local insurers wanted to avoid a, a moral hazard situation where you'd have lots of collusion um, to make spurious claims on the policies. Um, we've always introduced that concept with the, the, the idea in mind that for the grade A insureds, there is flexibility around that um, and you can adjust the rating model. The rating model is built around making adjustments based on the profile of the insured as well so that you don't get everybody tarred with the same brush on the moral hazard issue. Then in, in the conversations, um, because the cost of the legal costs associated with resolving disputes, whilst the, the tail of a, a court process here in India is, is much longer than it would be in the international markets, the cost of resolving the claim is significantly cheaper. So therefore, some of the, the in potential insurers raise the issue that potentially, you know, the, if you if you applied an excess as opposed to a deductible copay scenario, you'd be the, the insured would be left with, and your 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 main outgoing in, in terms of resolution would be legal costs. It'd be absorbed into the excess, and then. 
the insurer is not picking up any of the liability. So therefore, for them, the co-pay option works well so that you spread, the, you share the risk from the ground up whenever a claim comes in. And so again, the co-pay option is flexible depending on the profile of the developer and the model adjust. And if I may just, just um, touch on, just to provide one bit of clarification on what Sagar said, is that um, the, the, the rates that he mentioned are a one-time rate yeah, rather sorry. than because there's a there's a so common I mean, misconception yeah, yeah. that it's an annual. It's an annual These yeah. policies, as long as they're incepted, they cover you for the uh, from the inception until the end of the term of the policy, and you don't need to pay the premium uh, in in, a, in on an annual basis. There are some premium financing options in in the sense that you can spread it through over a two year period in installments if if required to aid with cash flow, but um, it's just a one off premium. No, thank you. That rate, yes. Great. Uh, Simon, my next question is to you. Uh, post the banking crisis where we have seen the cleanup of the banking system, uh, we are seeing rising NPAs and uh, now with the NBFCs also not doing that well, we are seeing a lot of securitization transactions, uh, stressed SFDs. Do you think this title insurance product can help in any of these type of transactions? Sure, Mr. So I think uh, having worked in some of these, I think it's interesting to note that um, when you lend, I think the core element to diligence, if you're selling a loan portfolio, is um, how good really is the security interest. And more often than not, the security interest in Indian financing transactions involves real property. Um, and if that is the case, then um, I think a lot of time is actually spent on understanding um, uh, understanding that real property and not only that there are you know from a from a real estate perspective and if you see the NPAs and the NBFCs today uh, that are that are being um, the NPAs that are being called to question uh, a lot of them have been also given to developers and therefore the ability of the of, of the developer to actually service that loan uh, also is called to question which depends on the quality of the asset that the developer has so whether it's security interest or ability to service loans, um, a lot of time is actually spent in, um, in, in diligencing the borrower as well as the asset that, um, that it holds. And um, given you know, how um, the sector really and the industry today, these things have to be done at lightning speed, otherwise the value of the asset drops even more. Uh, and therefore, you know, um, lenders or new buyers don't necessarily have the luxury of time of analyzing this in depth uh, especially if you know you want to be a little bit more commercial and you want to be uh, you want to win a, a specific uh, bid in this situation given the fact and and if the only requirement of the uh, of the new buyer of the new investor really is to uh, protect itself from uh, title risks um, i would think that this is a good product to have because A, um, the documentation that the insurer requires is limited. It can also do with a dated diligence report, so long as I suppose that diligence report is from someone that is reputable um, and it has done a seemingly thorough job. Um, you know, if, if you have that, and typically every bank today um, at the time of lending or every NBFC at the time of lending would have had done its own diligence and done some sort of title search. Um, or with respect to any security interest or with respect to the developer, um, you know, the, the kind of asset that it is developing. So that documentation should be readily available. Uh, and if there's somebody going to be underwriting the risk based on these on this documentation, I suppose um, this is a far, uh, this is a quite a lucrative product um, in terms of doing these deals. Um, given, I mean, of course it is a cost, but every, every sort of penny counts towards how commercial, commercially viable a deal is. You'll have to uh, weigh the pros and cons of uh, and factor in costs. Uh, but that being said, I mean, you know, at least it gives you a leg up in trying to do these uh, deals um, fast and at least absorbing some of the risks uh, that you would otherwise have to deal with by yourself. So um, it is definitely, uh, hopefully, will be used uh, a lot in these securitization transactions. Uh, given the assets that are being uh, uh, that are really being bought, um, in, in terms of in terms of I think distressed deals and CLP deals, uh, again it depends on what the asset really is. Uh, if it is a real estate uh, project, then yes, I suppose this is something that works, especially because 
um, you know, this product does not require warranties. And in an NCLT process, uh, you know, how do you sort of construct warranties? Um, it's is it, some is somewhat of a question mark, right? So therefore, um, to eliminate this, you have you could have, especially where the asset is only a real uh, a real estate asset, this product may uh, come, uh, you know, maybe maybe great. Um, but 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 having said that, I think um, a lot will also uh, uh, maybe the next question in terms of processes, etc. Uh, we still don't know that. If we probably have better light on on how the insurer looks at the process of underwriting this risk, yeah. uh, it could tie in into how lucrative this, this could be for such a transaction. Yeah, and also I think it will be interesting to hear about the timelines, yes. given that number yeah. of deals are high speed and you know. Yes. Okay. Everybody is worried about whether the insurer will be able to meet with the one or sure. two week timeline for yeah. closing the deal or not. So yeah. well, actually, I, I'll I'll pick up just to 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 link the flow um, mm -hmm. based on uh, what Simone was referring to in terms of the securitizations and distress assets, and then and um, what I'm going to say about the process is probably going to link in globally to whichever aspect of the pro product that you 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 purchase ultimately. But I've worked a lot in the international markets with the distressed loan funds on uh, transfers of huge um, non-performing loan books for various entities, particularly post the financial crisis in, in Europe, where you had lots of banks with um, bad uh, real estate based um, loans uh, sitting on their balance sheets and the need to actually unlock that um, to reconfigure their capital holdings and so on. And um, I've worked, you know, on, on the other side where the assets are performing, but there are large portfolio transactions where the product was used in a different context. It, the, title insurance, leaving aside the rarer type vanilla deals where you have, I say vanilla, they're high value, but greatly assets, individual assets. It, it has a spe specific unique application in these portfolio transactions, particularly. Um, a, when it's a non-performing asset, as you know, um, and you rightly both said, you know, it, it replaces reps and warranties. And in, when it's non-performing assets, you're not even getting that because you're not getting, you've got a distressed buyer, which who may sometimes be uncooperative. Um, and you're not going to get any any um, replies or requisitions on title at all. So all you have is, all you have to rely on are the historic, is the historic diligence that's in there. Um, so it replaces those reps and warranties, whether it's a single distressed, a, um, real estate asset or a portfolio. The second element of it is that it does actually reduce the time frame for these transactions because you're talking about portfolios with sometimes hundreds, if not thousands, of underlying assets. And getting the searches done on time, you're in, especially with you know the talk of some of the distressed asset funds that I have, you know, worked with in the international markets. I know the process. They're they're chasing after the same deals and they're in sealed bin competitive bid scenarios where time is of the essence, they don't have time to negotiate uh, haircuts on transactions, and they need to actually find the most cost effective and time efficient way to get these deals done. So what they're doing is that they are um, they're negotiating the policy and they're actually building in the cost of the policy into the transaction and replacing the uh, a deep dive diligence process with a, a shallow dive diligence process complemented by the title insurance. And the title insurers look at it from a completely different way from the way a legal firm would look at it because lawyers are paid to, and rightly so, to actually tell you where the risks are and to warn you about that. The title, the, the insurers, um, and Sagar will know this from the other products in the market, are paid to actually take that, lift that risk off your balance sheet and move it on to theirs. And that's what this is doing. So whereas the lawyer would give you the report on title and would give you all the, the qualifications and say these are the risks which they have to do because they need to make you aware of it, the insurers will then say, I'm aware of those risks because of the spread of the portfolio, because of the profile of the deal, because of the rating model that we've applied, we're happy to absorb all of those risks and we're prepared to actually accept that there will be claims and there'll be issues in there, but hopefully the model works for us and it puts it onto our balance sheet. So it creates those time efficiencies, it creates those cost um, efficiencies, and it, it frees up the lawyer's time as well to actually focus on the real 
technical aspects of the deal, which is the corporate aspect, because the titles have been diligence, as you say, Simi. So essentially, and, and the NBFCs, historically the banks, the diligence, real estate being such an, an important, critical asset where it sits socially in the Indian context, you know, the title diligence is done properly in some of these deals. The assets would have been properly diligent. So it the, the policy works in some ways as gap cover because it's picking up not only the state of the title at the time that historic diligence was done, but anything, any unknowns from the date of that last diligence to the time of the close of this deal as well. So it's also adding that additional comfort plus the undiscoverables like the fraud, which you could never diligence out of the transaction in any event. Most importantly, the most important USPs for the distressed funds or any PE fund that's investing in these kinds of transactions is the clean exit and the transferability of the policy because they usually take a five to seven year um, hold position on these assets, but they're investing in it to eventually exit. And that those warranties or that guarantee that the title insurance policy provides is transferable. So at the point of sale, they don't have to engage in debates over diligence again, or these are the known defects. I should say, so going into the actual underwriting, what you would do is you would you would do a, a, a an assessment of the portfolio as an underwriter, and you would pick up the known defects that would um, be disclosed in the VDR related to the historic title information. And those can be, like I've said before, covered as known defects and bolted onto the policy. And then you have the full wrapper that gives the entire portfolio good and marketable title cover. If it's an individual asset, what we would call for in, in whether it's a, a rarer transaction or a, a shopping center, a warehousing, we'd ask for the proposal form and the report on title and look at that again, assess it. The whole process, okay, so it's a portfolio. The, the lead time is probably two to three weeks, assuming that we get everything in. Um, if it's a single asset, the turnaround time is usually 48 hours. So you can, from, from point of submission of all the documents um, to getting a quote and drafting it. And that's as simple. Um, you don't want to actually build in, especially in, in a new concept that you're bringing to the Indian market. There was It was mooted at the time of product development whether and this is applied in some of the other territories globally, like in Central and Eastern Europe. The actual, um, the insurers ask for a separate independent title diligence report, which is the cost of which is borne by the potential insured. But that model was, we opted not to apply that model in India because of the diligence that we had done on the quality of the title reports and also the underwriting parameters around which title reports would be accepted from from which legal firms and the quality of those reports and also the, the alignment of the jurisdiction to the what is known in the in the UK courts and the UK jurisdiction. So therefore the process hopefully if you if, if there is uptake and you start to use it you would find very seamless. It's just submitting the proposal, submitting the the reports on title, if it's a portfolio giving access to the VDR so that the, the data tape can be interrogated and, and, and having some dialogue around that. Drafting the policy, issuing the, the, the quote, and then engaging with you on, on whatever specific policy wording needs to go in, endorsements and, and whatnot, to bespoke it to get the best coverage for you possible. Sure. Okay, so I think uh, what we can do now is we can uh, take questions from the audience. Uh, maybe we can start with uh, uh, if there are any questions uh, from the participants joining on phone. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on your touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. A reminder, you may press star and one to ask a question. The first question is from the line of Vishal Khandelwan from Pragna Advisors Limited. Please go ahead. Yeah, so my question is related to the inclusions and exclusions in the policy. So there was a live example recently in Bangalore where there was an NGT order which issued fresh buffer zone requirements around lakes in the city. 
so which affected some of the developments so i just wanted to understand whether this type of risk could be covered in the policy so and whether this would be qualified as a known defect which may arise in the future okay so if i may clarify um you it's a it, it was a future decision so you you acquired the property on the assumption that it was you could develop it for with in terms of the zoning regulations for a specific mm -hmm. purpose and then it was actually um that rezoned and and there was a moratorium on future development is that correct yes 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 that is correct yes. yeah so I, I i think i touched on this earlier unfortunately that is a risk um from an underwriting perspective it can't be we it can't the probability of that occurring is it's impossible to assess that and as i referenced earlier okay. it, there are there are opportunities to um, redress that sort of issue. That is an administrative law issue. If a local authority or a municipal um, corporation gives you an, a permission to develop a site or, or to, to, to use it in a specific way, and they reverse that decision, then the owners in pretty much the same example as you yeah. use, Nichelle, where they went to court right. um, next to the jail, you would have to go to court in the administrative law process and reverse that transaction against the government decision as being ultra virus. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that answers my question. Thank you. Thank you. A reminder to all the participants, you may press star and one to ask a question. The next question is from the line of Bismarck My Shah from Bishop Desai Associates. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Visma Shroff. Um, I have a quick question <clears throat> for all speakers in the panel. Um, I see that there is a possibility of an area overlap <clears throat> between the people who are, uh, between the professionals who basically go ahead and work on the due diligence report for a particular property and the title report, which may have to sort of come after a property. So is there an area overlap? Do you see there's, uh, this is an area where both sets of either the lawyers and the insurers would be working together? And if so, to what extent? Uh, I just wanted to have some kind of clarity on that because it seems to me that it's quite similar in uh, what they're trying to do and how they're trying to do it. Thanks. So, uh, so typically the way uh, these things work is from a diligence perspective, you will have number of areas of diligence that will be covered as part of the exercise. One area is, uh, you know, the corporate diligence uh, where you look at the entity and the, you know, any liabilities attached to the entity. Uh, the other area will be on the title diligence where if you are, let's say, acquiring an entity which is housing the project, the real estate project, then you would want to look at the, you would like to look at the title of the land and the building. Now, ultimately, this part of one diligence report, everything will get covered. But what will be important to see is what type of policy is being taken to cover the risk. If the intent is to cover the risk for all the areas, including corporate or environmental or, you know, anything relating to employees, then warranty and indemnity insurance policy would be the right policy where the entire diligence would be relevant. But if the idea is to only cover one aspect of the entire diligence, which is the title of land and building, then in that situation, uh, uh, you know, you will be only taking the title insurance policy. And again, you know, it's a commercial decision which will have to be taken because a normal warranty and indemnity policy, the premium would be somewhere in the range of two to two and a half percent on a ballpark basis. Whereas in a pure title insurance policy, as Sagar mentioned, ballpark number could be between 0.5 to 0.6%. So it depends on what type of policy is required to be taken. Depending on that, the diligence that will have to be relied upon, a uh, decision can be taken on. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think you. if I'm if I just may <clears throat> add to that, it depends on the actual. You're, you're absolutely right, Nishal. It depends on the particular type of transaction. So if you have an individual asset. There may be known defects that have been picked up, flagged in the lawyer's title report that need to be insured because if you if you follow the route of rectification or redressing that issue, you could be years down the line or it may not be possible to do so. 
Then you have the portfolio type transactions where the title reports have already been done historically. The lawyers who are acting in current transaction may be asked to prepare updated reports where the insurer selects certain properties and then the policy then works as a wrapper and complements the entire portfolio so it lifts a whole um, category of risks which are unknown that have not been diligence in the live transaction that need to be diligence and then you go beyond that to the undiscoverables or the impossibles where you don't get warranties from the seller so and the lawyers report on title doesn't actually plug that issue or deal with that issue and on top of that you have other undiscoverables like the fraud or um, historic missing records and planning documentation and so on that need to be plugged because there is a, a risk gap there between the, the extent to where the lawyer's report on title leaves it and where the insurance picks up the, the additional risk and, and supplements it. Sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. A reminder to all the participants, you may press star and one to ask a question. I think if we have any questions from the from the person person. From the person. Yeah. yeah, one I would like to ask you. Why this seven years cover only? Because as uh, you say, in property, normally nobody will go for resale in a seven year or five years, seven years period. It happens after 20 years, 25 years, they go for new property or a bigger property. At that time, they surface this, the problem will surface in that. They escape this insurance may not be helpful. Yeah, I, I can take that. Sure. So, when the product was recommended under the RERA uh, framework, the IRDI, which is the insurance regulator, published a report that recommended a minimum term of seven years. And my understanding is that that was linked to um, the Lloyds of London market, the insurance markets where they underwrite um, policies. These policies um, are unique in the sense that they're not annually renewable, as you know, they cover the title for the length of the term of the policy. And therefore, um, the, the, the Lloyd's market will only ensure based on their own reserving mechanisms internally for a maximum of seven years. However, the non-Lloyd's market, which are the, what you call company markets and insurance terms, um, they can go beyond that period. And so the product that's available does actually extend to 12 years. And the reason the 12 years was chosen for the Indian, the, the limit, the cap on the term of the cover is that 12 years is a limitation period for an adverse possession claim. And after that, by a fluxion of time, it's deemed that the title has been perfected and held on. So to, to, to respond to your point, yes, the, the average um, homeowner or, or property owner holds on to the asset for in excess of 20 years. But after 12 years, the risk profile seems lower because it's less likely to be challenged. So 12 years was felt by the international reinsurance markets to be a comfortable um, term of policy whilst they build the, the actuarial expertise to eventually unlock it, to take it beyond that to, to match the 20 year hold period for an asset. Oh, and then you can keep renewing it. Yes, you can. Yes, of course. But renew, uh, seven after seven years, you can renew it for further seven years? Yes. But in seven years, I'm talking about the other way. As a real estate investor, mm -hmm. you know, these assets are more self liquidating. So I, I invest for three to max five years generally. Yes. Uh, so as an investor, if I decide to buy this policy, I want it for seven years. Can can it be then structured as an individual uh, policy? So or, you know? Period lower than seven years. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 it, it may be in future because there is a need for it. At the present time, uh, for, to get this these products, um, as you know, with the insurance regulator, you need to file the product and all of these um, issues were disclosed. So you have to disclose in the filings. Uh, what the term of the policy would be and because they had recommended a seven year minimum term all the, the insurers that are providing the product would have filed it with a seven year minimum term it doesn't mean that they can't go back um, with a special dispensation from the regulator to get a, a lesser term but at the moment what they are permitted to do is to actually issue policies for a minimum of seven years that contract gets over yes 
free to flow. No, so what might happen in case of self liquidating proper, let's say it's a resi project, right? Then you might be able to sell it in three to five years. And when you are selling to the flat buyer, you let's say assuming the land is free freehold land, you will also be transferring undivided portion of land to the lottery or the society, right? Whichever is formed. Yeah. Now you may have liquidated everything, you may have sold everything to the flat buyer. But let's say tomorrow there is a claim from a third party on the land parcel, right? That the land parcel which you have sold to the allottees or the society, there was an issue with the title. In which case, what might happen is the allottees or the society might sue you back for selling a wrong title to them for which they already paid you. In which case, even though you may have liquidated and gotten money back, the liability may still come back on you even beyond five or seven year period time. So it's not that straightforward that once you have got the money, you are off the hook. But then you can just keep buying it, uh, reading, reading that it is a, See, that's, the, that's the risk assessment, right? Yeah. It's a risk assessment. If you feel that the chances of something coming up later are higher, then you'll obviously buy otherwise. Well, well, actually, you wouldn't have to keep buying it because once the benefit of it passes on to the allottee, if the uh, if the title yeah. is challenged, it will or, go to the or you can transfer the policy to <laughs> the allottee. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, either that either way, yeah. Again for a period of seven years. Yeah. Once that gets done, the ability to sue you back still continues. So it's in that but the responsibility of extending the policy or renewing so the policy then gets transferred to the allottee. Yes. To the society. Also mm -hmm. society. society. Yeah. Yeah. In the context. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. I just want to ask that question. If you don't transfer it to the end user or end buyer. Like you said, I think in many properties, issues do come up in between. Right. Then what? If you don't transfer, then obviously, you know, the obligation, your obligation to the society will continue if the title was wrong, right, or invalid. Is that society also has to take, an, I mean, probably an approval to transfer it? No, so under RERA, you have to transfer it. Under yeah. right? for RERA project, you have to uh, transfer to the society. To to that's, that's, that's a RERA yeah, so, for a RERA project, you have to, but RERA so is more applicable to under construction. But if it's a completed property, then yeah. anyway, RERA doesn't apply. Yeah. Yeah. But it's only a risk mitigation from your purchase long back, hmm. and now you are taking the insurance. Right. You are taking it for seven years. <laughs> And the buyer who comes in between, I mean, there's no record or somewhere in between, you have the third party confirmation. So, how is that? Okay, I'll take in on your first question. Um, the policy, the insured is defined as the developer. The, let's say there's a development agreement, you'll be in, you'd have an insurable interest pursuant to the development agreement. The landowner will also be insured. And the ultimate allottees will be insured for the term. So you don't need to um, endorse them on the policy when it happens. It automatically transfers the benefit. So when the claim comes in, whoever has the insurable interest makes the claim relative to their interest. So that that's that's how the mechanics of it work. Uh, you're saying, if I understand your second question, you're saying that if you are the developer and you bought a property now um, from somebody, and in between that, it's it's trans. There have been transfers, yeah. a chain in chain within the chain. Yeah. Anything that happened before your acquisition is covered. So whatever exposures there are there, you and whoever takes the benefit of the policy from you will be covered for all of those risks embedded in there. When you transfer in future, if you're referring to future transfers, yeah. if your lawyers have been negligent, they and they've created a risk. That's not covered for you, but if an unknown allottee, sorry, that? yeah, that's not covered for you. But if an unknown allottee buys, assuming that the title is is clear, they will benefit from that because as a consumer, ultimately. Okay. So I hope that but sort how of. Will, how will I know my lawyers? Well, this is why I, I said. My lawyers take Yes, yeah, so this is why I said um, the policies are actually the policies are no for policy in the sense that when a claim comes in on a title defect, the trigger for the claim is a third party challenge to the title, somebody claiming an interest in the title. There is no need to unravel who was at fault. The insurance responds and then it, it uses principles of subrogation to follow and recover the rights. Um, so that's a matter for the insurer after that. But all you need to know is that 
you will not be prejudiced, nor will be nor will your lottie be prejudiced as a result of you know any sort of ongoings in there that have not been properly addressed. Okay, so uh, let us do one thing. Uh, I think we can take some of the questions offline, uh, but uh, I think if there are no further questions from participants on the phone, uh, we can uh, close the session. And uh, you know, I just want to check if there are any further questions uh, from participants on the phone. So we don't have any other questions. Okay, great. So thanks everybody for joining this session and uh, thanks to the panelists also for joining this. I'm sure uh, both Rima and Sagar would be thrilled with yesterday's announcement from Prime Minister and Home Minister. Do you have one more market to, <laughs> <laughs> to, to sell your policies? Uh, but uh, thanks everybody for your time and uh, we hope that you enjoyed the session and found it useful. Thank you.